All right, if you've got a Bible, you're going to want it. Uh, the Pew Bible on page 615 is where we're going to be at today. If you've got a device, turn it on and turn the volume down, and we will run uh, through Isaiah 55 a little bit today. Next week, we're going to be starting about eight weeks on the Beatitudes. Vlad's doing that as part of his internship. And really, the Beatitudes are short, sweet, but profound because they describe really how life should be when we fully engage as believers in walking with the Lord. Uh, and so today in Isaiah 55, I want to kind of skip around a little bit, but, but get to the means of how we get there, how we become fully engaged worshipers, um, how we are continuously being conformed uh, as we set our gaze on Him, as we spend time with Him, and as we look to Him for, for really everything essential in life. Um, I'm going to read a portion, and then we'll, we'll back up a little bit and go from there. But this portion of Scripture, a lot of people know. Um, it, it's uh, very popular to quote. Isaiah 55, we're going to start in verse 10 and read through 13, and then, and then we'll back up for our exposition. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And thus saith the word. We, we talk about how his word comes, goes out and doesn't come back void. But what I want to show you is, is what is the purpose? What, what does it not come back void from? And to do that, let's back up in the chapter to, to verse 1. And we'll go fairly quickly through these, these first nine verses, um, but then get back to our point of today's message. In verse 1, uh, and this would, Isaiah is broken up into a few books if you were to look at its original writing, and this is really the ending of book 2, I think, maybe book 3, book 2. Um, and so he's, he's finalizing some things, he's concluding some things, he's trying to push them into a position of understanding where they are. Now this is the people of Israel he's addressing, but he's looking at a bigger scope. And depending on what you believe, millennial or no millennial, uh, this is pushing towards, looking towards an end of times, all right? For me, I, I think he's, he's pushing to the millennial, which is moving into uh, everlasting eternity. Um, come everyone who thirsts, verse 1, come to the waters, he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's a call. Isaiah's saying, come. We see this throughout the Bible when it comes to the Lord, to come, to look, to listen, to hear, to partake in, to eat, to discover, or as Jesus puts it, Follow me. Follow me. So come, everyone who thirsts. Now, Palestine would be pretty much without water on most good days. It's a dry, parched land. And so this would be an imagery for them that, that acknowledge their need. For those who thirst, come to the waters. So he's not talking about any body in their land. He's talking about somebody above their land. There's no constant source for this water outside of God himself. And so there's a spiritual imagery going on here. But I think it plays both and, like it, like it does in most of uh, the Bible's teaching, that, that there's a here and a now. There's a physical and a spiritual. And so pay attention with both sides of that coin. But come to the waters, and he who has no money... He later says, without money, come, come, buy, buy. And I'm like, what are you buying with if there's no money? And it's just coming. 
your presence. It's already been bought, as we'll see. Come by wine and milk, without money and without price. We're seeing the buy without price to you, but definitely price to him, ultimately. Wine throughout the Bible is, is seen as something that, that emits joy, that is to be in celebration, to be bringing back those poor in spirit to high in spirit, to those uh, that have a celebratory reason. Milk is a sustenance, uh, not in abundance, uh, but it is here. Without money, without price, you can just all come and buy. We think of milk around healthy livestock. We think of milk around babies and how it's just kind of a complete food in and of itself. So you've got this joy, a luxurious gift, and you've got this substance of sustenance. Why do you spend your money, in verse 2, for that which is not bread? So we've got money, and we're spending it on things that that are not substantial. We're, we're, we're following after things that the world probably has called us into, things that we see our neighbors do, things we believe will bring us this joy, bring us this sustenance. Not that there's not room for some of that. Uh, my pastor would always say, if you've got some extra change and you can get a double dip ice cream, go get it. It's good for the soul in many ways. But it's not where we find our satisfaction. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? If you remember the prophet Haggai, one of my favorite books to teach, he talks about how uh, they put their money in their pockets and it's like they have holes. It's always gone. They, they sow their seeds, but the, 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 the fruit never comes to full fruition. They work, but they don't see the benefit of it. There's always consuming, 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 but lacking, lacking, lacking. And when we try to do life, no matter how much of an abundance we have in material possessions, when we try to do life without God in it, without God foremost, then it's like there's this hole. The, uh, Pascal said, a hole with a God-shaped space, and only he can fill. And we try to put other things in there, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We're consuming non-nutritional value. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Uh, I have never been a fan of McDonald's, though I think everybody on this side of the continent thinks Americans eat hamburgers every day. We don't. Um, and definitely not McDonald's hamburgers. My kids grew up calling uh, McDee's Poo Bell. Poo Bell. Because we never, ever went there. Only maybe on a hot summer day for their ice cream that was quick and still not that good. But that's what the people of Israel were doing. They were, they were, they were eating junk. And they would look and see their groceries look good, their uh, food look fine. And, and he says, we're, we're, I'm not talking about that. You're eating of the world and not eating in a spiritual way. Incline your ear, verse 3, and come to me here that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. They're in Babylon at this time. They're in captivity. They're about to come out. And um, he's saying, listen, come, follow me. And while he does that, he says, hear with your soul so your soul may live. Don't just hear with your ears or with your eyes or with your mouth, not with your appetite, that you have been purposed for something bigger than this life. Not that we have to just negate it all, deny it all, and pretend that there's no fun on this earth. There is, man. Just look out this window. There's some beauty to be had. But it will never be satisfying as it should be unless you've got the God peace in place. Incline your ear. Come to me. 
When is the last time you sat still? Not talking about your devotional time. I hope you are doing that on a daily basis too, that you're entering into your word, you're studying both to learn the text, but also to devote yourself, to emote towards him. Those things you should be doing. If you need help with that, that's why we're here. Come see me or some of the leaders. But when was the last time you sat and pushed your Bible aside and just sat in his presence and enjoyed being his and him being yours? As I always teach you, heaven is not necessarily about the place of the gold streets, the the 12 foundations, the no sin, the no death, the great feast. All that's great. But if you remove God from that place, It's just like living in the Cote d'Azur without God. It's empty and it's void. It's without tangible significance. There is no satisfaction that is lasting. That salvation is not meant to get us to a destiny. Salvation is meant to get us in relationship to Him. And that's why there's already and a not yet that we can relate to Him today, here and now, as if we're there already. And we will relate to him perfectly one day when we are truly there. When is the last time you just sat down and enjoyed being his? We have a great deck right across the valley that looks out upon this wonderful view. And some of my favorite moments are are when Jen and I are just sitting there. And we're taking in all this beauty, yes, but we're taking it in in a couple who knows that we are redeemed, that these blessings are a blessing to overflow through us to other people, that our purpose on life has significance, and it's not just a 401k, a retirement in the future, walking beaches and collecting seashells. But we're here to help build in a kingdom that is everlasting. Enjoy the walks on the beaches. Collect the seashells. But be purposeful in the big picture. The everlasting covenant in verse 3 is a reminder of the rainbow, of the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, the covenants that God has put out there and said that they are coming to pass. No matter what you do, David, try to mess it up with Bathsheba, I'm still going to work it out. Kill my son, it's all in the plan. My purposes are moving forward. My covenants are good. My promises will be fulfilled. His faithfulness is not stifled by my sin. It's not stifled by your sin. And he desires for you to walk with him, not to focus on your failings, but to focus on his faithfulness. Verse 4, Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. I think he's talking about Jesus. He's definitely talking about the Messiah here. Um, That he is one who is going to go out and witness, a commander for all peoples. Behold, verse 5, you shall call a nation that you do not know. It's beyond Israel. If you remember the Abrahamic covenant, there was land, seed, and blessing. And the third uh, promise is a blessing to all the nations, that Israel was meant to be a center for God and Jerusalem to draw all nations in. And they were meant to draw all nations to the one true God. And then after Jesus was crucified and the church got scattered, we went from a centrifugal evangelistic message to centrifugal, where now we go to the ends of the world. A witness to the peoples, a commander for the peoples. You shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God. I think in the millennial, if my theological disposition works out, and it's not a big deal. If there's no millennial, I'll walk into heaven with the rest of y'all. But if it does work out, I think this is a time when Israel will rise up again, and there will be a restoration, and there will be a revival. And once again, that little place on earth that is known for so much turmoil for so many centuries will be again a place that 
that instills the Spirit of God and calls people to himself. Because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. There's a near and far impact, Israel and beyond. God will use them to draw others to himself. And as we come to him, we are to be attracting others to himself. And if you're not doing this, and I tell you this all the time, then your, your spiritual life is not satisfying to you. If you're not putting your name out there for his sake, then you're not getting what should be going on. That we were made to be redeemed people in the process of redeeming others. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Uh, just like Noah in the flood, there was a day when grace was no longer abounding. The door closed, and those who listened, those who acted on faith, which were only eight people at that time. Jesus says the path is narrow. I think there's going to be millions in heaven. But I think there's going to be many who miss out. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. In other words, it's a call back. No matter where you've been, no matter how dirty, no matter how much chaos you have contributed to, come back. Return to the Lord, he cries out in verse 7, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Seek, come, listen, follow me. Today, 1 Corinthians says, today is the acceptable day of your salvation. Acceptable day for you, if you've already been saved, but maybe straight off, to return. God will have compassion and will forgive. You think of Luke 15, where it's all about lostness, you think, because you read about a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. But really, it's not. If you look at the pronouns in, in that chapter, it's all about him. It's about the one who, who finds the coin, who finds the sheep, who re, receives the returning son. It's about his forgiveness and his faithfulness and his abundance of love that is just asking you, come to him. And we don't get it. And that's what verse 8 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are as higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts more than your thoughts. We don't get it. We read the news, we watch the headlines, or we scroll uh, the pages, and it just looks bad. It looks tough out there. And we have a tendency to believe the toughness of the news rather than the good news that is over and abounding. And in his will, working out his pathway for his purposes. And then we come back to verse 10, our text. And it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, so you've got this imagery of rain and snow coming down upon the earth. And, and what you would expect, as you see, that as that snow melts, there's green grass coming up underneath. There's fruit coming forth from the earth. For as they come down, they do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, that there is a provision that is being made. And it's a physical imagery. And then he switches to verse 11. So shall my word, so like the water, like the snow, my word is going to be a provision. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It's a spiritual provision. And it comes through his word. And his word, I think, yes, stands for the Old Testament, the New Testament, and everything contained. It stands for the life of Christ and, and all those things that he has told us about. It stands for his attributes. It stands for what he calls us into. It stands for everything sourced in God. It, his word, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose 
and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And we find great delight in this promise that it, it shall accomplish, it shall succeed. But I, I think we stop there often. And we, we don't continue on past verse 11. And, and the question is, uh, what is this purpose? It says, it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So what is this word, this water, this snow that comes upon the earth? What is this provision? What is the purpose that it's meant to obtain? And then verse 12, as the chapter ends out here, 12 and 13 for you this purpose is for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace that you are supposed to be joyful and at peace in the midst of this chaos all these circumstances that are gathering around in our feet that we're having to trudge through like two feet of mud every day that somehow his word comes upon us and in the midst of that that we're going out in joy and in peace. And as you do that, that's how you proclaim him. As you live distinctly different from the earth, the people that are on the earth that do not know him, as you bring joy and peace into a moment of chaos and confusion, it brings an aroma of Christ, a light that cannot be put out, a brilliance that can be seen. And that purpose of his word going out and coming back to him, the coming back to him is in the praise of the saints. In the purposeful going forth of each of you who are redeemed to bring more in that are redeemed to add to the praise chorus of eternity forever and ever and ever. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The only way you get there, and I have about 15 other sermons on this, but the only way you get there is time in his presence. Not time just studying your Bible, not time in devotion, not time just in singing his praise, but time in his presence. Because you can do all those things. We can stand in church and sing and not consider ourselves in his presence. Honestly, if I asked you when was the last time you just stood or sat in his presence and admired him, it should have been when we were standing and singing. It ought to be. That's why we do it. It's so that we can come and have a moment, shut out the world, and just give praise to the one and only true God who is worthy, worthy, worthy. But the busyness pulls us away. And the habits that we get into cause us to be more like our neighbors who don't know Christ than those in this room who do. And we become, we, we, we normalize that. All right, we've got two songs, a responsive reading, some announcements, two songs, sermon, song, lunch. No, I, I do it too, and I'm the guy giving the message sometimes. And we normalize this. And we need to break through that. And that's why we need to gather. So when some are low, hopefully some are high. When some have been distance, some have been near. And so when we gather, we, we see the appropriate examples. And we draw in, and where I'm just mimicking words, it turns into a, a, a thunderous praise. And we reset on Sundays. We reset on Tuesday nights looking at Philippians. And we return to purpose. And that purpose is to know him. And overflowing from that, you will make him known. But the purpose is to know him.
The purpose of heaven is to be with him. The purpose of salvation is to be able to be related to him. The renting of the curtain, the, the throwing off of the holy of holies is so that we now have complete access to God. For you shall go out in joy. You will be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. More imagery. What does it mean? I think when you're walking with him, everything is of him. When you are going forth to him, that you see him in a way that um, brings everything under his will, everything with him in view. And one day, I think creation will be redeemed. I think in many ways this describes, uh, I don't like it, people say return to Eden, and that sounds great, return to the garden, but we're not going back to the garden, just to be clear, even though I may use that imagery. We're going better than the garden. In the garden, we could still succumb to temptation. Where we're going, we're going to be like the angels where, not in form, but in mentality to where we will sin no more. Satan will have no access. Temptation will not exist. Can you imagine that? So not a return to Eden, but beyond Eden. Instead of thorns and briars, the curse that comes from Genesis 3, we're going to have an evergreen lifestyle, which is verse 13. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And both of those are evergreen trees. They're always green, always full of life, always giving off life. And I don't know. You can read the commentaries on your own. But on verse 13, the thorn shall become a cypress and the briar shall become the myrtle. Is it God taking a substance and making it into a new substance? Or is he just dismissing the last and bringing forth new? Take it any way you want. But uh, I know I'm the thorn and he's making something new out of this. Is he completely destroying me? Maybe. He ought to. But what's coming forth in our lives, what's coming forth in this world, what's coming forth out of his salvation is a new heaven and a new earth. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. It will be everlasting. And everlasting. And once again, everlasting. You can try to do this on your own. Uh, I've partaken in doing Christianity this way where uh, it's my willpower early on in my Christian life. I'll get up, I'll set the alarm, I'll read this many chapters, I'll pray for this long, I'll serve in this ways, I'll go to church, I'll give like this, and and it's willpower. And I guarantee you, it'll last for a bit and it will fail. It will fail greatly. Not that doing those things is wrong, but doing those things out of your willpower, thinking that you can reform yourself, it will fail. Or I've also tried more study. I just need to know. I just need to know more. And you do. You need to know the contents of this word, front to back, as good as you can. But more study isn't going to get you there either. And when those two fail, usually we just start praying for for a, a, a heavenly intervention. God, just change me because I can't change myself. And that's probably closer to reality. And I actually have known people. I mean, Paul walking on the road and getting blinded and then getting zapped. It's pretty immediate for Paul. I've seen that type of testimony. But more so, often, it's you entering into his presence, you sitting there. Yeah, do your devotion. Yes, learn what he has revealed to you to know. 
but then push it aside and just sit on the deck. As one old mystic saint said, I see him, he sees me, I'm happy, he's happy. Don't go too far with that, but it's kind of the essence of what we're doing. We're sitting there in his presence, having learned, studied, praised, prayed, and just enjoying the fact that I'm part of the redeemed. I'm part of his eternity. I'm part of his plan. That I was destined for hell and destruction and he has lifted me from that. Thank you. And just sit. Sit. For those who are struggling and saying, yeah, you don't know me, and I'm like, yeah, you don't know me either. Uh, I think I said it maybe last week, but my pastor said, if I knew everything that God knew about you, I wouldn't let you in the doors. And if you knew everything that he knows about me, you wouldn't come. 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So we need to admit it, just sit there. In fact, part of the practice of sitting there is sitting there, knowing who you are in front of God and just saying, this is it. I, I, that sin, yeah, number 100,000 times as of yesterday. This, yeah, I'm not saying that we uh, excuse, I'm not saying we don't fight, we do, but, but to come and realize that even in my messy state, that even while I was still a sinner, Romans 5, 8, he pursued, captured my heart, brought me to Christ. And to be at peace with the fact that I'm not good enough to be received. I'll never be good enough to be received outside of Christ. And in Christ, I'm all in. I'm all in. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. The, the way that should read is his faithfulness and justice demands his forgiveness. Demands a strong word when you point it at God, but basically say it this way, his faithfulness and his justice are so right, so correct, so perfect that he cannot forgive you when you claim Christ's blood in place of your own. Get good with God. Acknowledge your faults. Repent. You should repent often. Confess often. It keeps you humble. Receive the forgiveness. Don't just stop with repenting and leave feeling bad about yourself and like you need a shower. Receive the forgiveness that he loves you in the midst of all this and then return. That's the other thing is we receive forgiveness and then we decide, and I'm useless now. No. Return. He wants to use you. Revelation 7, 9 says, After I... This I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages. This is where it ends. He's gathering. Look around the room. We've got a variety of ethnicities in here. I was at a prayer group uh, Friday night, and there were basically eight women, and they were all from different places, and it just cracked me up. That we're here to pray and no one came from the same place. And no one got here through the exact same means other than the redemption through Jesus Christ. This multitude from all tribes, peoples, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, giving praise. So for our applications, go get forgiveness. Know that you're headed for a place that's with Him and praising Him. And then today, to pray without ceasing. And I know that's intimidating to read in Paul's letter in First Thess, but what he's saying is that 
you get to a point that where you've sat with him so often, where you've studied his word so well, that you've devoted your time to getting to relate to him, that before long you wake up and your first words are, thank you God for a new day. And you lay down at night saying, thank you for getting me through that new day. And protect me tonight. And he's invited into every aspect of life. When you drive, when you relate, when you are with your wife, your kids, your workers, when you are retreating, when you are doing whatever, that he is always, and it becomes, and you start to wake up going, oh wait, I haven't really talked to him in this instance. And that, I think, is the prayer without ceasing. That is the walking in the Spirit. That is the, the, the what we're meant to be, the purpose for which His Word goes forth is to bring back His praise, to bring back His people, to bring back this power that rests in us through the Spirit within us, through the Son who's died for us, to the God that we're given praise to, that it becomes all-inclusive in everything we do. For you shall go out in joy, Isaiah 55, and be led forth in peace, that you will wake up and go, and there will be joy in the midst of chaos. There will be peace overwhelming the confusion. Ah, I'd be lying if I said this was every day for me. It's not. It's not. But it becomes more and more as I continue to return and just practice sitting with Him, devoting to Him, studying with Him, congregating with you guys to remind me of the body of Christ that's going forward into eternity. That we are being conformed to His image daily, that He will complete the work that He has begun in you. He promises that. We were made to worship. Just giving him back praise of his worthiness, of saying thank you, praise you. His words going forth, it will not return without accomplishing what he purposes. His purpose is for you, for the redeemed, to bring forth his praise.